Greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our lecture today. I'm Dan Philpot, director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights. Anyone who has been reading global news with any attentiveness in the past year will have no difficulty in seeing the relevance of today's lecture. In China, Christian churches are being destroyed by the dozens. 21 Christians were recently beheaded by ISIS in Libya. In India, Christians have recently been subject to forced reconversions by militant Hindus with the acquiescence of the Indian government. Christians are not by a long shot the only religion that suffers persecution. And over the course of history, Christians have been on the giving side of persecution more than a few times. Today, however, the persecution of Christians is widespread and of necessary concern to any advocate of human rights. Here to tell us about this is Rupert Shorts, whose extraordinary book, Christianophobia, tells the story through a remarkable tour de force of global violence and discrimination compiled through his own tour of the globe. Rupert Short worked at the Tablet, the International Catholic Weekly, from 1995 until 2001. Since 2000, he has been religion editor of the Times Literary Supplement and held a visiting fellowship at the University of Oxford from 2011 to 2013. Besides Christianophobia, a faith under attack, his books include Benedict XVI, A Life of Joseph Ratzinger, and Rowan's Rule, a biography of Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. He writes for publications including the London Daily Telegraph, The Guardian, and the Madrid-based Revista de Libros. Please join me in welcoming Rupert Short. Thank you, Dan, for that very generous uh, welcome. It's a, a delight to be back in Notre Dame. Uh, even if, as you'll be aware, the subject of uh, today's uh, gathering is, is a pretty melancholy one. In the video he made in early 2005, before committing suicide and mass murder, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, ringleader of the July 7th London bombers, justified his action as revenge for the recent killing of Muslims by Western armies. Much has been said about the moral vacuity of this statement, but far less made of its sheer incoherence. As Dan has just outlined, if we look beyond Iraq and Afghanistan and on a time frame stretching back well before 9-11, we can see innumerable Christian communities on the defensive against rampant forms of intolerance, both religious and secular. The problem has worsened dramatically since the turn of the millennium. About 200 million Christians are now under threat, more than any other faith group. That's a figure I've derived, incidentally, from the World Evangelical Alliance and from the, the Pew Forum. And it constitutes about 10% of the global Christian fellowship. Now, this, I think, ought to be a major foreign policy issue for governments across a vast belt of the world. And that it is not tells us much about a rarely acknowledged hierarchy of victimhood. Sadiq Khan and his associates were allowed to practice their religion freely in Britain, yet there is scarcely a single country from Morocco to Pakistan in which Christians are fully free to worship without harassment. Christians who convert to Christianity or other faiths in most of these societies risk harsh penalties. There is now a severe risk that the churches will vanish from their biblical heartlands in the Middle East. The suffering is no less acute elsewhere. Before the partition of Sudan in 2011, for example, the regime in Khartoum was responsible for the deaths of two million Christian and other non-Muslim civilians over a 30-year period. Before East Timor gained independence from Indonesia, 100,000 Catholic non-combatants were killed by agents of the Suharto government during the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And in 2012, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Abdullah, 
officially declared that, and I quote, it is necessary to destroy all the churches, unquote, on the Arabian Peninsula. Christians in Nigeria live in regular fear of violent attack. Nigeria, incidentally, is the place where probably 90% of all the Christians dying violent deaths in the world at the moment are. Um, and there is clear evidence that the attitudes underlying such aggression are fermented through official channels. One reason why Western audiences hear so little about religious oppression in the Muslim world is straightforward. Young Christians uh, in America and Europe do not become radicalised, and persecuted Christians tend not to respond with terrorist violence. Another explanation is linked to the blind spots that can affect bien pensant opinion formats. Parts of the media have been influenced by the logical error that equates criticism of Muslims with racism and therefore as being wrong by definition. This has further distracted attention away from the hounding of Christians, helping to cement the surprisingly widespread idea that Christianity is a Western faith. As you know, but many don't, it's anything but. But my argument is emphatically not based on polemics about a supposed clash of civilizations, still less on an uncritical attitude towards my fellow Christians. The Church's past record of violent intolerance, a record that persists incidentally in Russia, the Balkans and other parts of the Eastern Orthodox world, is obviously shameful as well. And although the view that Muslims have been the perpetual victims of Christian aggression down the ages rests on a falsification of history, I reject the equal and opposite fantasy that holds Islam to be a uniquely violent religion. Misconceptions of this sort usually spring from a failure to distinguish between Islamic piety on the one hand and Islamism as a religio-political ideology on the other. My argument, rather, is shaped by two sorts of awareness. First, that much anti-Christian prejudice and violence, as uh, Dan Philpott indicated, whether in China, India, Vietnam, North Korea, Burma, Sri Lanka, Cuba or Israel, among other places, has nothing to do with <coughs> militant Islam. And second, that a number of grievances felt by Muslims are reasonable. For example, I believe, in line with the clearly broadcast views of most church leaders around the world, that the Iraq invasion of 2003 was a serious mistake, and have a keen sense of the West's role in promoting the sense of injustice felt by many Arabs in particular. More broadly, it seems equally clear to me that Christian mission in 19th century Africa was often politicised and geared to undermine the spread of Muslim influence. That Western, above all, sadly Anglo-French, adventurism in the Middle East during the 20th century played into the hands of Arab nationalists and watered the seeds of Islamic revivalism. And that Al-Qaeda drew strength from the West's indulgence of dictators in the region before the Arab Spring, and still now. These factors supply context to my case. They do not, however, invalidate it. Now, the oppression of Christians is especially worthy of note given the so-called return to religion over recent years. Whether you view this development with relief or unease, it has become increasingly obvious that Christianity and Islam are the two most formidable belief systems in the world. <coughs> now, whatever the extent of secularization in, in Western Europe or North America, and even here the, the evidence is ambiguous as various traditions experience revivals, almost all other societies on earth display high levels of religious belief and practice. Three quarters of humanity professes a religious faith. That figure is projected to reach the 80% mark by 2050. Now that, that might, some, what I've just said, might be slightly less surprising to an American audience, but believe me, it comes, it comes as a shock to um, complacent Europeans who assume that the rest of the world is going to play catch-up with them, rather than realising what seems a more likely scenario, which is that secularisation has gone into reverse and that it's, it's Europe. 
that is the, the odd man out, as it were. The scale of the turnaround has been extraordinary. Thanks to the so-called third wave of democratisation during the 1970s, as well as smaller waves of freedom since then, millions were enabled to shape their public lives in new ways. In country after country, politically empowered groups began to challenge the secular constraints introduced by the first generation of modernising post-independence leaders. Often, as in communist societies, secular straitjackets were imposed from on high. In other cases, such as Turkey, India and Egypt, secularism retained legitimacy because the elites considered it essential to national integration and modernisation and because of the sheer charisma of these countries' founding fathers. In Latin America, right-wing dictatorships, sometimes in cahoots with the Catholic Church, imposed restrictions limiting grassroots religious influences, particularly liberation theology and Protestant uh, sects. As politics liberalised in nations including India, Mexico, Nigeria, Turkey and Indonesia in the late 1990s, religion's influence on political life increased deeply. Uh, even in the United States, as, as you'll be especially aware, evangelicals exercised a growing influence on the Republican Party during the 1980s and 90s, partly because the presidential nomination process came to depend more on popular primaries and less on the decisions of party elders. So nowadays, where political systems reflect people's values, they usually reflect people's strong religious beliefs. An inventory of faith-based political groups would include uh, Vishwa Hindu Parishad in India, which sowed the, the seeds of Hindu nationalism reaped by the BJP during the 1990s. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in various parts of the Middle East, Hamas in the Palestinian territories, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Hadlatul Ulama in Indonesia, Pentecostals in Africa and Latin America, and in the Catholic world, an array of forces including European Social Democrats, Opus Dei, and the newer religious movements. <coughs> Faith communities are, of course, also developing remarkable transnational capabilities, appealing to foreign governments and international bodies deemed sympathetic to their cause. This, again, is another trend that... Um, Europeans in particular have been slow to, to pick up on, uh, rather leery in the past, rather nervous, I think, about um, acknowledging a, uh, a, a, um, the, the sort of added value provided by, by faith-based organisations. And yet, common sense would suggest that across a huge area of the world, um, more or less wherever you go, particularly to more outlying areas, it's, it's very often the church or the, the local mosque that forms a hub for the distribution of aid or provision of education or, or medical care or what have you. So again, whatever one's opinions of the merits or coherence of religious belief or the truth of one creed vis-a-vis -vis another, the conclusion reached by two prominent American sociologists, many of you will be familiar with, Timothy Samuel Shah and Monica Duffy Toft is hard to resist. And I quote, the belief that out outbreaks of politicized religion are temporary detours on the road to secularization was plausible in 1976, 1986, or even 1996. Today, the argument is untenable. As a framework for explaining and predicting the course of global politics, secularism is increasingly unsound. God is winning in global politics, and modernization, democratization, and globalization have only made him stronger, unquote. <coughs> Perhaps on reflection, this shouldn't surprise us that much. Atheism feeds off bad religion, especially fundamentalism, whose easily disposable dogmatic certainties now form one of atheism's main assets. On the other hand, it is much harder for atheism to replace the imaginative richness of a mature religious commitment and the corresponding assurance that life is worth living responsibly because it has ultimate meaning. And yet, 
Faith is like fire, to cite a sobering analogy. It warms, but it can also burn. As the uh, British Jewish thinker uh, uh, Jonathan Sachs and others have pointed out, people lived in self-contained spaces before the modern era, physically and therefore intellectually. It was possible to believe that our truth was the only truth. And that, that is naturally no longer possible in a globalised world. So while the 20th century was marked by clashes of political ideology, there are strong grounds for thinking that interfaith relations and the politics of identity that they betoken will be one of the dominant challenges of the 21st. And as I won't need to remind you, harmony between the religions remains a remote goal in some ways. Good religion promotes, con uh, promotes uh, conflict resolution. Bad religion fosters discord. As many commentators have pointed out, the destabilizing effects of fanaticism can be seen far from Iraq, Syria, and the ruins of the World Trade Center. Formerly secular challenges, such as the confrontation between Israel and the Palestinians, have taken on an overtly religious cast. And religion has played a role in recent and ongoing civil wars from Sri Lanka to Chechnya to Sudan. Along or near the 10th parallel of latitude north of the equator between Nigeria and Indonesia and the Philippines, think of a, a belt of land that, that includes um, <coughs> Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea. In this, in this area, a little north of the 10th parallel, <coughs> religious fervor and political unrest are reinforcing each other. And this point should be granted even if one accepts religion status as an immense and perhaps the preeminent source of social capital in existence. And on the positive side, of course, faith-based conviction has mobilized millions of people to oppose authoritarian regimes, inaugurate democratic transitions, support human rights, and relieve human suffering. In the 20th century, religious movements helped end colonial rule and usher in democracy in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Asia. There really is a, an extraordinary um, connection between um, freedom of belief and uh, more general forms of social capital. Uh, in, in country after country after country you will find that where, where they allow people, where they acknowledge freedom of conscience, um, not just on paper in a country like India, but, but in and, um, communist and ex-communist countries, um, but where, where they really implement it, then um, all sorts of other um, indices of, of well-being sort of shoot, shoot up as well. So given the durability of faith, we, we can draw an equally certain lesson for today and tomorrow. That if religions, especially the six so-called global fellowships, Christianity, is Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and um, uh, Sikhism, if they're not part of the solution, they will almost certainly be part of the problem. This much, perhaps, is common sense. Another fair inference is that religious leaders function better as sources of, of influence at some distance from political leaders um, not as wielders of direct power themselves. Now, to bring much needed texture to this discussion, we ought to disentangle fair and tendentious accounts of the terrain and be aware of how it gets hijacked by hotheads at either extreme of the, of the divide between religion and secularism. I think this is really important in a, a climate where Hardline secularists in particular are turning on religious groups, perhaps they're a little bit scared of, of being um, accused of Islamophobia, so they, they don't single out Islam and they, they condemn uh, religion, seen as a, in a sort of un umbrella way, in, in um, ways that are perhaps superficially plausible, but don't, don't really um, stand up to serious scrutiny. 
I would say that it's above all unscientific to single out religion. What religion are people talking about? Which manifestation of it? Wrong to single out religion for criticism while ignoring both the colossal violence of 20th century anti-religious regimes and the strife associated with other forms of social bonding such as nation or ethnic group. In Northern Ireland, to cite an obvious example, religion is deeply interlaced with the legacies of British imperialism and Irish nationalism. In other parts of the world, uh, uh, religious affiliations often shade into ethnic differences, which in turn merge with claims to land, water and oil. And the tenth parallel is an obvious case in point. Geography forms a major source of tension in several other countries in, in this region. So faith differences can be exploited to intensify what are basically turf wars and other geopolitical conflicts. Uh, in a country like Nigeria, for example, which had, has the great drawback of being sort of half Christian and half Muslim, one of the very few societies that is, you've got a, an arid north, a swampy south, and a fertile <coughs> belt in the middle with, with lo lots of people from both ends of the country want, wanting to move to the centre and, and thereby um, ca causing a lot of tension. Um, the subject also needs, for the, those of you of a historical bent, I think it needs to be placed in the, in the broader context of 19th century and post-colonial nationalism. The imperial project of Peter the Great onwards, and especially Russia's conflict with the, the, Ros the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, where Russia was seeking to, to drive down to... To, to reclaim Constantinople for Orthodox Christianity, but also to seize it as a, as a, a, because of its, its strategic value. So there's a sort of geopolitical element to all of that. That process brought waves of nationalism into Southeast Europe and, and Western Asia, often involving the re, redrawing of frontiers in ethnic or, or ethno-religious ways, and population exchanges and the subsequent persecution of minorities that were seen as not being truly Turkish or Bulgarian or Greek and so forth. Analogous processes later took place in the Indian subcontinent and if I were American I, I think I would be scratching my head and, and wondering why uh, Europeans seem to be um, so pu pugilistic. Um, there, there has been um, a uh, horrendous amount of, of, of conflict in, in Europe in, in recent centuries. But I think if you, if you bear in mind um, trends like that, it, it starts to become um, uh, a little easier to, to understand um, why, why the continent is, has been um, su such a tinderbox in, in some respects. And um, thinking about uh, U Ukraine now, it's, it's striking that, that very few regular... <coughs> political journalists that ever seem to have anything to say about the, uh, the religious dimension there, which is um, sadly an important one. Something like half the dioceses of the Russian Orthodox Church are actually in, in Ukraine. <coughs> uh, a powerful account of population movements that unfolded continuously from the 19th century onwards is supplied by the late Tony Jutt in his book, uh, it's a history of Europe since 1945, um, called Post-War. And he charts how the consequences of events such as the Armenian Genocide and the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were eventually held in power by the consolidation of, of the Soviet Union. But the twilight of Soviet power then saw new homogenizing pressures, including the impulse to ensure that people's political leaders belong to the same group as themselves. So many factors come into play here, economic, political, ethnic, linguistic, and religious. And these um, have combined with one another in what seemed to Judd and others a, a predominantly nationalist post-colonial framework. There are always local histories to make sense of particular contexts, of course, but the, the general processes around the world share broad common characteristics. So determining the place of religion in conflict is, is a matter of, of patient elucidation. Yes, faith can be put to corrupt use, largely because it's practiced by fallible human beings. 
um, but attacks on religion drawn from hit and raid runs on history are callow and, and can be, be dangerous. The complaint that church life outside Europe is somehow compromised because Christianity often spread on the coattails of empire forms a further instance of how a, a complex discussion can be short-circuited by ideology. These days, historians are much more ready to acknowledge the substantial part played by indigenous peoples in Christian expansion. In Africa, Asia and Latin America, many local Christians have long been critical agents in missionary work given the small number of expatriate missionaries in relation to the size of these continents and their populations. So the nurses, medical assistants and compounders in mission hospitals, the teachers in the mission schools and colleges, the evangelists and Bible women who go into villages and homes across vast areas of the world, these people are not only physical intermediaries with vastly varied local societies, but also translators in a deeper sense as they help interpret Christianity in local languages and cultures. I think that's a point but, uh, worth emphasising when you um, hear people uh, criticising um, Christianity as, as nothing but a, as, as a kind of um, Western export. Um, uh, if they were a bit better informed, they, they, they'd realise that it's, uh, it's an export from the Middle East uh, not not a um, an import to it. Um, there's, there's a line about a, a general. I don't know whether he was American or European, but he he went up to a um, an Arab Christian sometime in the in the past twenty years and said, "Oh well, when 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 did your family convert then?" And um, the guy gave him a quizzical look and said, "About about two thousand years ago." Um, <laughs> Anti-Christian feeling can regularly be premised more on envy than on fear. Indian Christians in Kerala, for example, in southern India, are, are, are more uh, prosperous than their Hindu neighbours usually, and so they're resented for the same reasons as prompted historic prejudice against the Jews in Europe. In other parts of India, Christians are loathed by Hindu extremists for opposing the caste system. I'd, um, I'd never been to India until I started researching this book, and I, I, I was absolutely um, sickened to see a, a system that had involved the, the subjugation of a large part of the population um, for thousands of years, and there, there were still people defecating into the river and then drinking the water and cleaning their clothes in it. I mean, the, the, these were societies that just didn't seem to have um, uh, advanced at all in, in, in many centuries. And, and there, I think, we, we can um, lay the blame at, um, at, at religion, if not at, uh, at Christianity. Christians are, are fighting all of this. Sometimes... Christians are resented as well as admired for their enormously influential work in education. In Taiwan, for example, only 3 or 4% of the population is Christian. Uh, nationalist Chinese persecuted the churches almost as much as their communist counterparts. But the Taiwanese educational system was largely founded by Canadian and Scottish Presbyterians. Taiwan itself is not noticeably hostile to Christians now, but the climate is less benign in other countries where Christian educational legacy is also strong. Um, sometimes, as in China, Christians are feared with reason because they're heralds of a more open society. Nearly 9% of China's population belongs to one denomination or another. And the journalists John Micklethwaite and Adrian Wooldridge of The Economist, authors of a, a book you may know of called God is Back, are among many observers to, who, to have forecast that a third of Chinese will be Christian within a few decades. Um, so that, that the churches face large-scale persecution in China and elsewhere says much about their remarkable strengths as well as, as well as their vulnerability. When you think that 
religion had notionally been extirpated completely from China as recently as 1970. It's absolutely astonishing what is what has happened there. It's it's called the um, the largest, with justice, the largest re religious revival in in human history. Um, So I, I hope um, from this rather piecemeal set of remarks that um, it's clear I'm, I'm not assuming the truth or falsity of any particular creed, um, even though I'm a, a Catholic myself, merely that freedom of belief and association are unqualified goods. Nor am I seeking to offer either a comprehensive survey of the subject or, or a grand narrative about an alleged global campaign against the church. I'm aware that Christianophobia, like Islamophobia, is a, an elastic term, perhaps implying a, a passive attitude, unlike the more active anti-Semitism, for example, and that prejudice should be distinguished from more overt <coughs> forms of ill will manifested in, in state ideology or, or various sorts of behaviour. But it just so happens that neither as anti-Muslimism nor anti-Christianism as terms have, has caught on, and so Christianophobia seemed to me a, a valid term, granted due caveats. Um, I've said that Christians can come under threat for lots of different kinds <coughs> of reason. It's, it's important to stress that um, you know, I'm not suggesting for a moment, for instance, that 200 million Christians have got guns held to their throats. I'm talking about discrimination as well as persecution. If you live in a country like Turkey, everyone has an identity card, your, your religious allegiance is on your identity card. If it says Christian on yours, then there will be a glass ceiling to your career in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's, there's absolutely no question that Christians are second-class citizens. That there are strong um, tabs on all Christian foundations, schools for example, very tight controls on seminaries, restrictions on building work. If you do build a church there has to be a mosque next door, the mosque must always be taller than the, the church. Um, there, there, there's a bit of a, a kind of ratchet in that uh, they closed down one orthodox seminary after another but then said that the, the um, Ecumenical Patriarch, the Patriarch of, of uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, the, the, the leader of the, the Orthodox, senior leader of the Orthodox Church, who isn't even allowed to use his title, Ecumenical. They said that this man must, must always be a, um, a tur Turkish citizen. Um, so lo lots, of, lots of different kinds of problem. El elsewhere it can be to do with um, uh, apostasy, so-called people who aren't allowed to change their religious allegiance. The blasphemy law in Pakistan is is very badly misused. So the the victims of Christianophobia can have more in common than the perpetrators. And among these shared characteristics, I think, is a reluctance, in turn, admirable understanding, but also heartbreaking, to tell out news of their respective Calvaries. Now I think this is a very, very important point because it, it came up in interview after interview that I, I did with, with people, um, vastly, vastly better Christians than me, some of the most exceptional human beings I've ever been lucky enough to, to encounter. And a good number of them in, in obedience to the Sermon on the Mount and Paul's appeal in Romans 12:12, 12, 12, quote, <clears throat> rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation, Bless those who persecute you. Many of these people accept their suffering as a source of unity with Christ. You know, they've seen their houses burnt down in front of them or, or what have you, and they didn't see it as exactly as a, a badge of honour, but they, they felt that it was the price that they paid for being Christians, and I, I think that is worth emphasising. Um, also, I, I should stress that it doesn't mean that news of their plight should be suppressed, and it certainly doesn't exonerate them. Um, how are we doing for time? Do you want me to, to pipe down shortly, or...? Um, another ten... Uh, another ten minutes or so. Q&A. Q&A.
Great. Well, it would be, be very interesting to, to hear, hear your own points of view. Um, I think what, what I've just said shades into another important topic that it is worth trying to, to, to get onto the table to, to just, just give you uh, the, uh, as much of a, a sort of gamut of, um, of, of, of ideas about this theme as I can. And it's, it's to, to look just very briefly at shifting understandings of martyrdom held by, by Christians themselves, because of course there would have been... Um, many, many Christians uh, in, in early history who, who would have regarded it as perfectly normal that they would face persecution. Uh, and uh, Jesus, as you know, represented his coming death in sacrificial terms and a, a distillation of the, the scholarly consensus about how Jesus saw his, his mission and what, what Jesus stood for in just a few sentences. I think might run as follows, that he proclaimed the arrival of the kingdom of God with all that it entailed in terms of the remission of debt, the espousal of the poor and the marginalized, the casting out of evil spirits, and the release of those resources of love, generosity, and compassion, which are so easily repressed by social convention and misguided religious scrupulosity. This mission in turn led to Jesus' death, which he fully accepted, sensing that it would have redemptive power for the community of believers he inaugurated. <coughs> now, the opposition to Christianity voiced by the Jews and later the Romans led to protracted official persecution of Jesus' followers, as we all know, until the conversion of the, the Emperor Constantine in the early 4th century. This seismic event caused anti-Christian sentiment to change shape for predictable reasons. That's the emperor's conversion. Rome was the enemy to huge areas of Asia, including China, India, Persia, and Syria. As Constantine prepared to do battle with the Persians, Christians who had long been sheltered by Rome's enemies were now viewed as fifth columnists. Around AD 340, the emperor Shapur II of Persia unleashed a campaign against Christians even bloodier than anything experienced during <coughs> the previous three centuries. That, that statistic is, is sort of un unknown to, to many of us. It's worth stressing, I think. So those who refused to take part in Zoroastrian worship were killed. Hundreds of, of bishops and priests were publicly executed. And, a, and almost 200,000 Christians may have died in all. Now, the crucial point is that Shapur did not persecute Christians because he was offended by their beliefs. He acted from a sense that the church was politically significant. One consequence of this was that the definition of martyrdom would in due course be tightened up, and the Vatican, to cite one of several examples, would declare that to qualify as a martyr, a candidate had to have been killed because of odium fidei, that is to say, um, hatred of the faith as such. Sometimes, though, politics and theology cannot be disentangled, and we might judge that we have come full circle in important respects. During the 20th century, many Christian groups became progressively more identified with support for democracy and human rights, purportedly enlightenment values, which in fact originate in the Hebrew prophetic tradition and the teaching of Jesus. So what I'm saying is that, that models of martyrdom have been refreshed, in effect. The Jesuit liberation theologian John Sabrino has summed up the matter from his Central American context. Quote, The church is being persecuted because it defends the life of the poor, denounces the, the unjust destruction of life, and promotes the practice of justice, unquote. This, I think, is the light in which the discipleship of many recent Christian martyrs can be seen. And as, as you all know, perhaps, there were, there were more of them in the 20th century than during the previous 19 put together. Figures as varied as Grand Duchess Elizabeth in post-revolutionary Russia, Maximilian Kolbe in Nazi-occupied Poland, Lucien Papiedi in... New Papua New Guinea, Esther John in Pakistan, Martin Luther King here, of course, 
Wang Zemin in China and Oscar Romero in El Salvador. Since these people were in no doubt that values such as human dignity and equality are part of any account of Christian belief worthy of the name, it is not hard to see why they are sources of inspiration um, beyond as well as within their respective folds. Um, now, just one uh, very brief final comment about uh, whether Christians are persecuted in the first world. And I, I um, to write my book, had to interview people whose loved ones had been murdered in front of them in some cases or had their homes burnt down or lost their livelihoods. And I think it, it devalues the currency somewhat to say that Christians... Um, uh, are being persecuted. Um, there, there's no... Um, uh, um, um, there's no shortage of thoughtful people, liberal as well as conservative in outlook, who feel that employing the, the ideology of human rights to assault faith communities is very harmful. And in my own country, for example, when, when a, a Christian airport worker was banned for wearing a cross, this was a British Airways employee, or a nurse was sacked after playing a role-playing exercise in which he suggested praying for a patient, I think alarm bells ought to ring. And philosophically minded commentators have spotted a, a French-style uh, dirigiste impulse behind much recent equality legislation in Europe and elsewhere. Traditionally, the, the English model of liberalism defined the space in which governments may not intervene. English-style liberty sets the limits of the state. French-style liberty, by contrast, has tended to be imposed by the state. Now, saluting its place in contemporary democracies, Jonathan Sachs describes religion as, quote, part of the ecology of freedom because it supports families, communities, charities, voluntary associations, active citizenship, and concern for the common good. It's a key contributor to civil society, which is what, uh, which is what holds us together without the coercive power of law. Without it, we will depend entirely on the state, and when that happens, we risk what J.L. Talmont called totalitarian democracy, which is what revolutionary France became. You'll recall that in France, you were sort of... Um, uh, situation <coughs> became extremely authoritarian in the name of freedom within a, within a very short time. So it'll be evident that Sachs prefers the, the traditional English way to the French, um, but it, in case that sounds a little bit nationalistic on my part, he, he's also voiced the concern that UK legislation has started to display a distinctly French uh, tinge over the past decade. Um, and Broadly comparable concerns have been expressed by, by church leaders, especially um, Pope, Pope Benedict, and one doesn't need to agree with, with all of their views. Um, uh, the, uh, Pope's, Pope Benedict's views and, and, and those of others on, on, on every sphere of life to, to grant that, that they nevertheless have a point. Um, so elsewhere in the West today, Christians are mocked or caricatured as soft targets by an irreverent media, often much warier about turning its fire on other faith groups, and by an academic establishment sometimes incongruously deferential to political fashion. Anti-Christian blasphemy is common, but public figures who spurn secular multicultural orthodoxies may expect trouble. Campaign groups such as the Christian Legal Council in the UK tell us that Christian beliefs are now under threat because Christian, guess, uh, Christian hotel owners and would-be foster parents who disapprove of homosexuality have themselves incurred the disapproval of the state. Now, this is a very big rag bag of complaints and some of them strike me as reasonable. Others overlook the benefits of a free press and a robust public conversation. Others, again, in my view, are, are marks of special pleading. But whatever their status, none of the opinions, insults, or laws judged offensive by many Western Christians amounts to, to persecution as um, chronicled in, in the pages of my book, which I hope some of you will read. Um, 
very lastly, Dan mentioned I, I work, I'm an editor on the uh, Times Literary Supplement, which is a publication like the um, uh, New York Review of Books, except we, we um, review many more titles and also in several languages. Please um, feel free to uh, tell yourselves uh, when you leave. And, um, uh, I've spoken quite enough, as I said, it'd be great to, uh, to learn a bit about um, your own input into this conversation. So uh, thank you and over to you. Well, I have two questions and a comment. So during your um, talk, you spoke of interfaith dialogue, and there was a lot of emphasis on interfaith. So I was wondering whether you make any distinction between interreligious and interfaith, because atheism is actually quite compatible with a lot of religions. It's compatible with my religion and Buddhism, and maybe interreligious dialogue would be more inclusive. Secondly, the narrative about India, uh, a secularism imposed by the elites that has no resonance with the mass, uh, that has limited resonance with the masses, is actually um, a flawed in my opinion, a flawed understanding of Indian secularism, because why European-style separation of church and state is not really followed so much on the ground. There is a, a sort of tolerant, fluid idea of religion as culture, in which people of different faiths live together and get along by adapting. Like, we, we celebrate Christmas, though, you know, and you, you would see that over vast swathes of population. The fringe elements that you actually describe are ridiculed and laughed at. And the government, which is a right-wing government, has gone on the back foot because they claim to be uh, acting on the acquies acquiescence of the government. The government has made statements rejecting these ideologies, even though it's a right-wing government. So mm. uh, that's something I wanted to point out. And thirdly, um, I feel that after... 200 years of colonization, if our country has some people who defecate in reverse, to find that sickening, I think, takes away from what we've achieved over 60 years. We have remained a major national power, a large democracy where the rule of law is followed. We're not torn by ethnic strife. So, uh, but I just feel like if it's so sickening that some people live in poverty and defecate in uh, uh, in reverse, then maybe the civilizing project of colonization should have been carried on a little longer. We would have ended up being better people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I of all people should not uh, express a, a, a view on that, but um, uh, certainly not in favour. Um, I, 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 I take your point on various issues. I, I don't altogether agree with you to, to be honest. I mean, as you're aware, Hinduism. I mean, part of the point about Hinduism is that it's it's a it's, it's a rag bag of, of beliefs. It's it's I mean, the the word in the, the the idea that it represents a coherent religious system is itself a reflection of rationalistic Western scholars uh, going there and, and trying to um, pull things together. I I wouldn't suggest for a moment that um, many. Um, Hindus aren't very very tolerant. I, I was talking to my news agent um, back in in London two days ago, and she was telling me how, how she <laughs> lights candles to Mother Mary, as as she she put it. But they're 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 um they're, they're just different shades of of Hindu um, as there are of of Muslims, and of course vast numbers of, of Muslims harbour no violent in intent um, whatever, but it, it was very um, very distressing to be in Arissa among the, the Khans and the Panas, these these two forest peoples um, who, well if, if you read the chapter on, on India in my book you'll, you'll see what happened, I mean a, a nun was gang raped, hundreds of people were killed, thousands of people lost their homes in, in the um, the big outbreak of violence of 2008, but um, around, <coughs> around India all the time, I mean, one is experiencing um, 
uh, pockets of attacks on, on Christians here and there. Yeah, um, Notre Dame is currently struggling with uh, much of what you have said today. We have been invited by uh, a, a prominent university in China to partner with them and have a joint university in China. And there's a significant amount of interest in doing that, but there's been also significant concern that has been expressed um, about religious persecution in China and whether or not we could have a true um, open faith uh, representation in China. I wanted to see if you had any opinions about um, the idea of a university like Notre Dame trying to open up a joint university with a prominent university in China and being able to be truly authentically religious and Catholic. Yeah, um, it, it's very important that you, you uh, consult people who really know what they're talking about on, on that. Uh, subject because I, I'd hate to offer any hostages to fortune and it, it sounds really important. Um, in, in the UK, the, the, the public schools, which you'll, you'll know are, are our um, private schools, are full of um, kids from all over the world, particularly from Asia, whose parents think that they can get a, a particularly good education in, um, in the UK or, or the US. I, I suppose it's, it's partly connected with, with language and the sense that their, um, their, their children will get a head start in life if, if they speak good English, although I think we, we can pride ourselves in, in thinking that, that um, the best of what we have we, we do very well which obviously includes Notre Dame. I mention that because m many of these historic schools in, in England are, are setting up sort of franchises all over Asia, including in China. So it, it would be very interesting to, to get their, their point of view. My, my sense is that the, the situation in China is, is patchy. They, they realised that they were very a very long way behind the West in the 70s and 80s. They decided that they needed to follow us, so they, um, somewhat to the consternation of, of secularists, they thought, well, religion has, sorry, the West has religion, and that must be a component in its success, so check, we will allow some religion. The West has a market economy, we will allow a, a market economy. What they want, of course, they, they like they like Christianity to the extent that it can produce hard-working citizens, but not... Uh, when it produces, um, so they so they like docile Christians. They don't like Christians who bang a drum for for um, human rights. I, I've come across people who worship relatively openly. People who only ever go to mass at about um, three in the morning as underground Catholics because it's the only the only safe time to uh, to to go to a service. Um, so if you, um, if you wanted to um, establish contact with me, I can certainly put you in, in touch with um, pe people with, with, with expert knowledge, both of China and, and of the, the university world. Um, so I'm, I'm sure they could give you a steer. I want to ask uh, something. Um, you know, obviously, as we've talked uh, over breakfast, I'm very, you know, very sympathetic to, to uh, your, your views and your analysis. But let me propose a certain kind of devil's advocacy that one might hear. Is Christianophobia really um, a global systematic phenomenon at, at all? Um, one could say that it's in part the artifact of the fact that Christianity is the largest religion. And so if it were another religion, that you might find equal proportions, or, or, or you know, what one might say. But, but another thing is that there seem to be a remarkably diverse set of circumstances under which Christians are persecuted. I mean, you think of like North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, Libya. I mean, um, you know, struggles we're having in the West. I mean, it's um, an enormously difficult, uh, diverse set of circumstances, perhaps can, corresponding to the enormous spread of Christian populations. Um, I mean, is there some common core of things that are something happening here called... I, mean, I think, like you know, John Allen's book was called "The Global War on Christians," but but that almost suggests a kind of systematic, concerted 
uh, effort. That's, but, but, but really, can it be called part of the same thing? I, I don't think the title of John's book was, uh, was one that I would have chosen myself. Um, no, I, I think it was uh, histrionic, really. And I, I'm, not, um, I'm not wanting to suggest that there is a global war against Christians. If there's a family resemblance, it's more in the behaviour of Christians themselves. And one of the, one of the anecdotes that really um, <coughs> impelled me to write this book was when uh, a friend told me that a, a contact of his had told him about the bombing of a, a church in um, Kathmandu in Nepal a few years ago. And he said, if this had been a mosque, if it had been a temple, if it had been a synagogue, then all hell would have broken loose and the, the implications would have been international. But it was a church. The members of the congregation picked themselves up, dusted themselves down, adjourned to a, a neighbouring barn, I think, or cinema, and carried on worship. But there, there was no retaliation. And when you... So I think I would... Um, I mean, you, you emphasise that you were playing um, devil's advocate, Dan. So when you said if, if other faith groups were as were as numerous as, as Christians, wouldn't they be facing just as many problems? And I would say, well, um, actually no, because it's, it's only Christianity and Islam that have a, a sort of global presence. But Muslims are, are not really being persecuted by, um, well, they're certainly not being persecuted by Christians. They do face considerable persecution from um, uh, some Hindus in, in India, and they, they are facing difficulty in, in Burma and, and China and, and elsewhere. Um, but sad to say that the really striking thing about Islam is how, how persecuting it is at the moment, and not only of Christians, but of course of, of other Muslims. And everywhere I, I can in my book, I have wanted to flag up the hardship faced by other faith communities. You know, if you are a Shia in Pakistan, your life will be hell. If you're Sunni in, in Iran, uh, ditto. If you belong to the uh, Ahmadiyyas, um, which are a, a Muslim sect, which I suppose in some ways correspond to, to Mormonism in the Christian world in that they, they believe in a, a later revelation. But um, Mormons, of course, are, are tolerated, and um, the Ahmadiyya are, are persecuted um, very, very um, vehemently. Uh, and um, so, I, 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 I really felt that there was a. Um, there's a compelling ground for this, and, and just to, I, I don't want to sort of stir the pot, but I, I would like to plant a thought in your minds in case it hadn't occurred to you. But Christianity, in principle, has considerably more grounds to feel threatened by Islam than Islam does than, than, than the other way around. Because it's, it's actually part of the core of Islamic teaching that Judaism, that Jews and Christians have access to a certain degree of the truth, but that the fullest ex disclosure of God's will comes in, in the Quran. Muslims, as, as you probably know, have a, have a sort of concentric understanding of salvation in which Christians and then, then Jews occupy a, a sort of liminal position quite close to the centre and then um, other groups are, are further out. Whereas, from a Christian point of view, you might say, well, what? For, for the revelation of God po post-Christ? No, no, Re revelation, as the Catholic Church teaches, en ended with the death of the last apostle. And so that's, that's a, um, a further ground, I think, for applauding the, the restraint of, um, of Christians. And... Um, I'd also just like to quickly add that, I mean, London, where, where I live, is, is one of the great um, 
Islamic centers of the world. I mean, you know, there is total freedom of worship for for Muslims in in the Christian world right now. But that 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 um, that compliment is not repaid. you on the, um, the line you want to draw between um, the experience of persecution <coughs> and a number of parts of the world that you've uh, described um, involving you know, uh, uh, execution, torture, etc., and the, um, the experience of persecution in, in, by many people in the, in the liberal West, which I, maybe is a form of legal sanction efforts to constrain for public expression of faith, etc. I wonder if there's a if there's a way that these two in some ways are somewhat connected uh, in the following way um, that um, the way in which in particular Western elites tend to regard Christianity as historically a source of oppression, historically a source of um, injustice, uh, of inequality, um, hierarchy, etc makes it difficult for Western leaders and elite opinion makers, et cetera, to recognize persecution of Christians elsewhere. So the very thing that you think is most obvious about the persecution of Christians in other, in other lands actually doesn't really rise to the level of a sort of public policy concern by those in leadership positions yeah. in these Western liberal democracies. And it seems to me that there's, there are you know, fairly significant efforts afoot to attempt to get these leaders to recognize that, that these constitute of persecution. So can at least it be suggested that the, the, let's say, the orientation toward a different kind of liberal persecution in, in, the, in the modernized West is actually to some extent, if not the source of persecution elsewhere, is um, implicitly contributing to its um, uh, uh, ongoing, pers uh, ongoing uh, 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 execution, etc. In as much as it's unable to see it as a form of persecution, simply because it's almost incomprehensible that Christians could be the, yeah. the, the subject. Yeah, of I'm um, I'm happier with the word um, discrimination than, than persecution, but I take your point. Have we? Uh, oh, sorry, we got on. Uh, I have a question that is related to the anecdote you said about the. A Christian from the Middle East was asked when he converted. And my question is, do you think that it would be helpful or even possible for, for us to weaken or break down the association that is so strong between Christianity and the West? Because whenever, whenever we think of, I'm, I'm talking about the Middle East specifically, whenever we think of Christians, the general public would think of the West, would think of Rome, of the Vatican, etc. And then this brings a lot of uh, negative feelings and fear and mm. all of that. So do you think it is possible and could be useful to break this association, to break this link that is, that is always there between someone who's Christian and the Vatican? Rome? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about the situation in, in the US, but in... In Britain, it's, uh, I mean, we, you know, we may have sent missionaries overseas in past generations, but now very often that, that uh, process is taking place in reverse. And, you know, the, the parish priest will be an Indian guy. Um, and uh, it is um, really striking how, how Christianity is becoming more and more, a, you know, a phenomenon of the global south and, and, and of Asia. And, and um less and less of the West. I mean, just look at the, the way that Pentecostalism, for example, is spreading like uh, wildfire. Honeycombing round the, the edge of the global megacity, you see thousands upon thousands of very um, democratic communities. And whatever one thinks of the, the theology of Pentecostalism, it's, it's um, the, the social capital speaks for itself. I mean, if you see part of the key to women's advancement as, be, as being um, getting men to be monogamous, getting men to give up alcohol, what have you, not to be, to engage in domestic violence, then Pentecostalism um, and evangelical Christianity are, are huge um, 
funds of social capital, they are also resolutely non-violent, which is why the media pays pays no attention to them. There, there, there's a saying, at least in, in, in my country, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And the, it's part of the corruption of my trade, you know, where we're interested in, in strife. And as one famous news editor said, I'm sorry, the, the church getting its act together is not a, a story, and we're not, we're not interested. Anybody else? Well, join me in thanking Rupert Short for having someone else.